I tracked everything about my life for the last six months. Here are the results. I started collecting data on my life at the end of last year. I'm still collecting data and my plan is to collect data till the end of the year. Let's jump in. Here's my mid-year check-in for my total life tracking system. All right, to get started, I tracked 131 out of the last 164 days of the year. As you can see, I tracked the least amount of days in December because I started this right at the end of December. For January, I had a rough start and didn't hit 20 days in January, but I got better in February, March, April, and finally in May, I was able to track all of my days. I cut off the analysis for this round of tracking at the beginning of June, which is why I only had about two or three inputs in the month of June. So my tracking got better over time. If you look at the days of the week where I tracked, you'll see that I tracked the most or was the most likely to track on a Wednesday, and I was the worst at tracking on Fridays. Starting with some metrics, my weight fluctuated between 150 to 156, and you can see two distinct dips. One of them coincided with my trip to Japan, where I was walking more than 20,000 steps a day, and the other coincides with when I started doing better at my calorie tracking. More on that later. My average weight was 153 pounds, which is two pounds less than when I started at the beginning of the year, a full 13 pounds lower than the goal that I set for myself back in January. When you look at my workouts, I worked out 77% of the days that I tracked, and I didn't work out 22% of the days that I tracked. When you look at the type of workouts that I did, I was the most consistent with train well, where I did just shy of 40 workouts using the train well app. After that, I mostly lifted weights, then cardio, then CrossFit, and then some combination of the two. On average, my longest sessions were when I did CrossFit with weight training, and the average length of that workout was 107 minutes. My shortest workouts tended to be cardio workouts, where on average, I was in and out of the gym in about 49 minutes. In total, the average amount of time I spent working out over the last six months was just over an hour at 61.74 minutes. In spite of all that working out, I still didn't meet my weight goal, so I wanted to take a look at my calories. You'll see that my average caloric intake peaked in January where the amount of calories I consumed were just over 2,000 and the average caloric consumption was lowest in April. But when you look at how many days I actually completed my food log, I only tracked about 49% of the time. So less than half of the entries were incomplete. So this data can't be trusted. And we can see that in this next slide. When I compared caloric intake on the X axis to my weight on the Y axis, you'll see that there is no relationship. If we never met before, hi, my name is Dr. Jamie. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and behavioral scientist who focuses on performance optimization, which is why I was so excited to bust out my statistical software to see if there were any statistically significant relationships across my data. Well, the correlational analysis found that there was no relationship between the amount of calories I consumed and my weight, which seems weird, but when you realize that my data collection was inconsistent and incomplete, it's likely that these reported calories are an underrepresentation of how much I consumed over the last six months. Compare that to the clear relationship between the amount of water I consumed and the amount of pee breaks I took. I've been going to the bathroom a lot. And I was thinking I should track how many times I go to the bathroom to see if this is a normative amount. And there was a clear positive correlation between these two variables. For stats nerds out there, the R was about 0.7, showing a really strong correlation. The more water I drank, the more I went to the bathroom. Finishing up on my thermogenics variables, I also was able to document how many steps I took every day. And you'll see a clear spike in the month of March and a minor spike in the month of April that correlates with my three week trip to Japan where I was easily walking over 22,000 steps a day. But when I look at this graph more critically, I see that when I'm not on vacation, I'm actually getting very few steps consistently less than the recommended 10,000 per day. All right, let's move on to sleep. Looking at my average sleep duration by day of the week, you'll see that on most days, I'm getting over six hours and 50 minutes of sleep. But on Fridays, I'm getting substantially less sleep, and that makes total sense because Friday is my favorite day of the week. It's when I get to close up shop at my regular nine to five and focus on my content creation. So it makes sense that I'm getting a lot less sleep on those days. I'm also getting less sleep on Saturday nights and Sunday nights, which was kind of surprising, but I wouldn't make too much of it. If you look at the scale, that's the distance between the actual numbers on the Y axis. You'll see that even though Friday looks like it's much lower than say Thursday, the actual difference is only 15 minutes because I'm getting around six hours 
hours and 40 minutes on Friday, and I'm getting just over six hours and 55 minutes on Thursday. So it looks like a pretty big difference, but it's actually pretty negligible. Let's look at my mood. Well, shocker, it turns out that most of the days of the last six months, I've classified my mood at the end of the day as joyful. But I was surprised that anger was my second most reported mood, followed by tranquil, proud, sad, and anxious. Now these six emotions are just how I chose to classify my mood. Now's a good time to go over what I mean by each of these emotions. This is my life tracker form that I have embedded into my Notion template. And here under mood, I have these emotions classified as sad, these emotions for angry, these emotions for anxious, these emotions for proud, these for joyful, and these for tranquil. So there's a bunch of emotions here that could be classified as joyful. So just looking at this, I am often kind of playful, hopeful, excited, or optimistic about something. So it makes sense that most of the days I'm going to classify my general mood as joyful. And angry has some things that might not necessarily be considered, you know, angry. So there is, I might feel distant or critical or frustrated. Hurt is interesting that I put it here and not in sad, but there are some other emotions here for sad. So I have identified just these six emotions, but they are not the universal emotions. I'll put those on the screen here. This is just the emotions that I feel most often and how I decided to classify mood. Okay, back to my presentation. As you just saw, joyful includes lots of other emotions. All of those emotions would have been classified as joyful and contributed to such a high positive mood rating. Now, what about anger? I asked myself, why am I so angry? And the behavioral scientist in me said, we need to deep dive and do some analysis. I figured I have four ratings of satisfaction in my life tracker, job satisfaction, relationship satisfaction, self-satisfaction, like how good I feel about myself and life satisfaction, how I feel about my life as a whole. And I thought that maybe how satisfied I was in one of these domains might be related to a higher likelihood that I was going to classify my mood as angry. I explored this hypothesis using chi-square analysis, and I found that days where I had the lowest job satisfaction, so that's a level one out of four, I was more likely to rate my mood as angry or anxious. When I had high days of job satisfaction, so level three out of four, it seemed like job satisfaction was related to my self-reported mood, and relationship satisfaction, when I had a relationship satisfaction level of four, so that's the highest in a one to four scale, I was also more likely to report that I was feeling joyful and tranquil. When I had lower levels of relationship satisfaction, so threes and twos, I was also more likely to report feeling angry or sad at the end of the day. Given that all of these ratings were done at the end of the day, it turns out that self-satisfaction, how I feel about myself, and life satisfaction, how I feel about my life overall, really didn't impact my mood. But it's important to note that my level of satisfaction in these four domains looked very different. Job satisfaction here on the right hand side, you'll see that out of four, there was never a day where I was fully or highly satisfied with work. Most of the days I rated my job satisfaction as a one, which is the lowest rating that I could give myself in that domain. My relationship satisfaction was almost flipped to that. There were no days where I felt like it was a one, like my relationship satisfaction was horrible. And there were many days where I felt like my relationship satisfaction was the highest four out of four. If you split my relationship satisfaction in half, making it a dichotomous variable, we have negative feelings about my relationship as a one and two and positive feelings about my relationship as a three and four, you'll see that overwhelmingly I feel positively about my relationship. There's a similar distribution on how I feel about myself. It turns out, I don't know if I'm just really satisfied or really full of myself, but I only rated my self-satisfaction a three or a four, and life satisfaction, which I allowed myself to have a five-point scale rather than a four-point scale. Five-point scales allow you to have a neutral rating, which is a three, and I wanted to give myself like a little bit more leeway when I was looking at how I felt about my life as a whole. So on most days, I felt at least average, and on all days, I felt at least average or above, and by far, I rated my life a five out of five on most of the days that I tracked. Since I've been talking about my husband, let's dive into my relationship satisfaction. Of the days I counted, we argued 37% of the days, that's 49 arguments in 131 days, and 62 days, we had no arguments. 
when we did have an argument, the level of argument ranged from a two to a four. None of them were ones, none of them were very low. And it looks like most of our arguments were pretty intense, three out of four. Since I had such a high level of argument, I wanted to see if the level of argument impacted my overall mood. So I did the same statistical analysis to see if there was a relationship between these two variables. And it turns out lower level of arguments or fewer intense arguments were associated with higher relationship satisfaction. Kind of like the pee and the water relationship, this makes total sense. I'm finally getting back into the swing of things and feeling a little bit more like my normal self. After losing my mom about 15 months ago, I feel like I'm finally finding a new normal. And as I started to get back into working out and moving my body, I was finding that I was a year older and I was identifying new aches and pains. It is really helpful when you go to the doctor and you have some objective data, things like how often you feel pain, where you felt that pain, and also if there's a relationship between what else is going on in your life and pain level. But it turns out I had a little bit more pain days than argument days. I had about 51 days or 38.9% of days experiencing some level of pain and 61% of the days I experienced no pain. When I did experience pain, that level of pain was pretty low. Most reports were one out of four. I did have 10 days where I reported a four out of four, and I took a deeper dive into those days to see the location that was causing the most pain. All of the days where I reported a level four pain were all in my stomach and in my shoulder. So that's valuable information for me to share with my doctor. In fact, we've already been working on identifying the source of my stomach pain and we're working to treat that. But I hadn't spoken to anyone about my shoulder pain and that's probably something that I should be looking into since most days that I reported some level of pain, the location was in my shoulder. Moving from physical pain to the psychological pain of spending money, here's a snapshot of how much money I spent over the last six months. Going across the top, this is January, February, March, April and May, I use the YNAB or You Need a Budget app to track every dollar that I spend. It's important to note that these rings also include what I spend on my savings. So money that I move from my checking account to my savings account also is captured here. So in January, I put just under $7,000 into my emergency fund and I spent a large chunk of money on my mortgage, which is a pattern that we'll see moving forward. I spent about as much money as my husband, so I spent $2,500 and he spent $1,900. We spent $2,000 on groceries and just under $3,000 on everything else. In February, we didn't have that large chunk that went into the emergency fund, so this month is more consistent with general spending habits. We spend about half of our money on our mortgage, and I spent just over $1,400, and my husband spent just over $800, and our grocery bill was halved at $1,000. Moving into March, this is when we went to Japan. So you'll see a lot of expenditures because we filled up our Japan savings fund and then we spent all of that Japan savings in March and April. So we spent just over $6,000 in Japan in the month of March, still have that large mortgage payment. And since I was spending all of our money in Japan, I was running all of the credit cards since I had the international credit card. My husband and I both spent $2,200. In April, we were still in Japan for about half of April. We spent seven and a half thousand dollars. We have our big hunking mortgage there and I still spent more money since again, I was spending for both of us in Japan. That is my excuse for this month where I spent just under $4,000 and my husband spent about $2,700. We also started contributing to our emergency fund, so we spent money and then we're gonna build up more money. May is the last month where I have a full data set and we have the large mortgage payment. We also have my husband spending about twice as much as I spent and that's because he went on vacation by himself. I just couldn't take off work and our son was still in school, but he had a break before he started at his new duty station, so he wanted to go home and visit family. So he ended up spending more than I did. We also spent less in groceries since he wasn't home and he's the big eater in our household. We also spent more money on restaurants than we usually do, spending just over $1,300. My take home here is that my mortgage is pretty big 
And when I added up all the money that I spent and my husband spent, it turns out that we spend roughly about the same. It's not the same month to month, but when you add it all up and get an average, on average, we're spending about the same amount of money. Now, YNAB is an awesome way to classify every dollar you spend, and it has these nifty graphs that it puts out for you every month. But it didn't capture any of my other variables, and if you're interested in doing a similar experiment and tracking everything on your life, you can use a Google form, which exports into a Google Sheets document. And Google Sheets is in the form of a spreadsheet that you can use to do advanced statistical analysis if you're slightly unhinged like me. Here are the tools that I used. I used my Apple Watch and my Ultra Human Ring to track my sleep and my steps. I used the Macro Factor app to track my calories. And I used Notion to complete my Google form every day. If you wanna put your own life tracker into a Notion template, you simply embed the Google form into your Notion Notion dashboard. You can do that by opening the drive from your Gmail account, finding Google Forms, giving your form a title, adding your questions, hitting publish, grabbing the link using this link icon, copy that, open up your page in Notion, forward slash embed, paste the link, and adjust the size of your tracker if you wish. Now here's some other takeaways or what we might call limitations in the behavioral sciences. It was awesome to have this group of tools that passively collected objective data, but a lot of my data, like other behavioral science data, was self-report measures, which have certain limitations. One of them is just our human tendency to forget things. I was completing my life tracker at the end of every night, right before I was going to bed. So there are days that I might've forgotten an argument, days where I felt like my mood was joyful because I had a calm and tranquil end of the day, but I forgot how crappy I felt a few hours earlier. Given that this was a nice mix of objective and subjective data, I'm really happy with the system that I have for tracking my life. And it was fun using programs like like SPSS and R to do statistical calculations on my data. Now, why did I do this and what am I using it for? Frankly, I did this because I love numbers and I love statistical analysis. And when you do behavioral science research, you are calculating what's called inferential statistics. You are making an inference about a population based on a sample of that population. And you hope that that sample, the small group of people, is representative of the larger sample. So what you find within that group is able to be translated to the larger group. But when you're collecting data on an entire population, of your own data, so I have all of my data, it's not a guess or an inference on how much sleep I get on average or how my job satisfaction is impacting my life satisfaction. I like that I can get objective numbers and clear feedback on my life. I know where I'm doing well. It seems like I'm generally in a good mood at the end of the day. I have a high level of life satisfaction. And even though I have intense arguments, overall, I'm reporting high levels of satisfaction in my relationship. I also know that I'm not doing as well as I'd like to do in some of those vital metrics. Things like sleeping less than seven hours a day on average is suboptimal. And I'm clearly not documenting my caloric intake, which could be impacting how slowly I'm losing weight. Finally, the elephant in the room was how dissatisfied I was with my job. As you might've guessed by how excited I get about numbers, it's not that I don't like being a behavioral scientist. I love that I get paid to answer questions about human behavior and how we could influence environments or individuals to optimize. I also love my individual clients that I have in clinical practice and my coaching clients. But as many of us who love our jobs and excel at our jobs, I was recently placed in a managerial position where I was no longer doing studies, I was managing other scientists that were doing studies. And that made me really unhappy. I still had the same joy that I had for my one-on-one -on -one clients and my coaching, but I wasn't collecting data, I wasn't doing analysis, and that's what sets my heart on fire. If you're interested in learning more about why I left my last job and what I'm doing next, check out this video right here. Otherwise, check out this video that YouTube thinks you'll like.